in the way church small group system that people are part of two separate yet equally important groups, the small group team who lead the groups and the members who deepen in their discipleship. These are their stories. Hey friends, it's Daryl and Jer here. This is the last Hi. corner of our whole small group calendar year. And then we take a break for the summer and we start small groups again. The I think it's the second week of September. We're back at it and new groups will start. Some of you will be in the same group, some in a new one or whatever. Uh, but I just want to take a moment and thank the small group pastors and teams. Uh, we just want to extend our gratefulness towards you for all the work and stewardship of these spaces. You're amazing. Uh, it's sometimes overwhelming for our staff in a good way to process all that's taking place every week in these different spaces. And Daryl, thank you for uh, teaching on the transfiguration this Sunday. <laughs> and uh, we're going to get into it. I, I just, uh, in a moment, want to have you give a summary of, of what you emphasize for our community. But I do want to read the text um, from Mark chapter 9. Uh, we're kind of, I think, in some ways, we're almost in the middle of our study um, or maybe a little past uh, middle, the middle of our study uh, in the gospel according to Mark. So I want to read this incredible account uh, and then invite your commentary, Daryl. But um, from Mark 9, starting in verse 1 through verse 9. And if you have your Bibles, you can go there. I'm reading in the NIV. And he said to them, truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Verse 7, then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had arisen from the dead. What a story. What a story. What a story. Um, hmm. I'm going to invite you to uh, give us a bit of a summary from, from Sunday and from your study uh, around what, what you felt to emphasize for our community. Well, as you said earlier, this is a difficult passage. You and I talked a little bit before about yes. all of that. A lot of layers. A lot of, I like that way you put it. There's a lot of layers, a lot of theological uh, revelation in here, and a lot of questions to ask. It's like you, you need to have a, a seminar on this, just not one sure. 30 or 40 minute sure. sermon, however long it is I went. It's so um, interesting, too, how it's this big theological. God, think, but then it's so human as the these friends of Jesus are taken into this, and you see their interactions. So there's all that side too, and, and they're, they're they're wrestling with this. They're wrestling. It's interesting how it, how Mark sets it up, and Matthew and Luke do the same thing mm. with verse one, where Jesus makes the promise. I tell you, there's people standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And so yes. people wrestle, what does Jesus mean? What, what, what's this promise about? Is he promising that there are people who right now, at that time, who are alive and will be alive when the new heaven and the new earth comes, okay. when the king? Or is he saying uh, people will be alive when the kingdom comes in power on Pentecost or when the kingdom comes in power on Easter morning? Right, so different perspectives, but then it's pretty interestingly placed here. It, that's well done, brother. And I think he's 
primarily then revealing to the, to, referring to what's going to now happen six days cool. later when he goes up the mountain. Yeah, now, over the years as I've encountered this story many, many times, hundreds, hundred times or more, um, I've had similar reaction that I've had now, right now. One is, I would love to have been there. You shared earlier, that's what, you, in fact, you shared that when people ask, what's your favorite story? Yeah, well, you know, we do that sometimes, if you've been around a small group for a while, we sometimes have icebreaker questions, something like, if you could pick one moment in, of history and just show up there, what would it be? So people choose all sorts of stuff, Red Sea, parting, whatever it might be. And sometimes I've said, maybe the transfiguration, because it just feels like this super unique moment. It reminds me of Revelation 1, where John encounters Jesus, similar language, but just what a striking scene where it's like the veils pulled back, something of his something different of his glories revealed and anyway yes i've said so, that before my, it's my first response i, I want to be i, I want to i be wished there. i could have been there i wish yeah and I, I wonder if i'd have been part of the discipleship group would i got included in the three or not <laughs> anyway that's another <laughs> that's another decision we a question we won't deal with but the other response i've had is that though peter might uh, people might kind of uh, dismiss Peter when he says, let's make some booths, because he had not, didn't know what to say. Actually, that's what I would say. Can we can we set up some more tents? Yeah, let's I'd stay like, here. I'd like to stay here. I'd like to stay a while. This is, yeah. 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 And and actually, that's it real. may be the, ab, the actual appropriate thing to say, because it's very possible this takes place during what's called the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. And at Tabernacles, they remember that God tabernacles in a tent, and the people lived in tents at, during that time. So it's possible. It's, if that's possible, this means this is October of the, mm -hmm. and a few months later, Jesus is crucified and raised. This is a major turning point in the life of Jesus, geographically. He's gone up to Caesarea Philippi, which is now th at the foot of Mount Hermon, where I think this takes place. And furthest north he's gone. Hmm. Who do people say that I am? I must go to Jerusalem and die. Hmm. And so you look at the map, he's now turning, and he just beelines for Jerusalem. Wow. This okay. is a major turning point. This is important for him. It's almost like, here's who I am a new, fresh kind of revealing, unveiling, and then and now I'm going to go do this, yes. what I've been purposed to do. Yes. yes, but just before I do it, I'm going to show you who I am. Yeah, yeah, really I, cool. I wonder if that's what's going on I here. wonder, too. That's really, that's really insightful. Almost to say, don't be afraid when you see it happen. I know who I am. Well, It's you, going to be okay. I, I it's wonder. beautiful. You yeah. talked through three um, kind of three areas of focus on Sunday, just, uh, the, you know, the people surrounding this scene um, and then the actual transfiguration um, unveiling of Jesus in this way. And then the third talking about the voice that came from the cloud. Why don't you walk us through those? Yeah, I was trying to think of a way to package all of this. Theology right. It's a lot of stuff going it together. On. So that scene away, the people, uh, you've got five human beings there. Yeah. You got Peter, James, John. Big, big names. Yes, big ones. Moses and Elijah. Peter, of course, the one whom Jesus says, I'll build my church upon the rock. The rock, I think the text is yes. Peter's confession that Jesus is Messiah. Yes. Um, and then John, uh, who is the disciple closest to Jesus, um, who, interestingly, will have an experience similar to this later yes. on the island of Patmos yes. when he's my age, when he's <laughs> older. And then uh, James, who is the first Christian martyr. And there's a couple Jameses. Yeah. When you get Jesus. to Acts, you meet a James who was killed. This is the James who's killed. Right. Then you yeah. meet James who becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. That's Jesus' brother. Yeah. And um, so we have to... He has a change of heart when he meets his brother risen from the dead. Doesn't he? Big change of heart. Uh, so those are significant disciples. Yes. He, yes. You know, why the other nine didn't come, I don't know. But the, these three, well, and so many scenes where those are the three with Jesus. And then Moses and Elijah. Oh, my goodness. Speak. Who show up. Mo oh, we could say so much about that. Yeah. Interestingly, both of those did not die. Hmm. Elijah is taken by, in a whirlwind to heaven. Hmm. Moses, it looks like he dies. Hmm. But it, it says... God buried him, and the rabbis of wrestle the fact. No one's ever found that burial place. Oh, fascinating. I didn't and know so that. there's the tradition that Moses actually did not die. Mm -hmm. So these are two human beings who have been trans, who have been, who moved into this other dimension 
of our reality that is close at hand exactly. in their humanity, like Enoch at the beginning. So that, now they, they can show up because they've been alive, and they've been alive in their bodies for all this time, so they show up bodily along with the others. So most of our discussion questions are going to be about that. Yeah, probably. No, just kidding. <laughs> but, just kidding. But anyway, why Moses and Elijah? It's, to do this quickly, I think Moses is the summary of the law. Huh. He's the giver of the law. Yeah. The law is associated with him. Elijah is the first prototypical prophet. So it's a way of saying, I think, the, the law and the prophets wow. have shown up to and, say, and there's this affirming, it's him and the work he's about to do. That's right. So just six days be, before, yeah, he says, I have to go to Jerusalem. And it's Moses and Elijah saying, that's right. That's, that's clearer the, for me the than law, it's ever been. That makes law, so much sense. The law has always led this way to, Je to Jesus, and to Jesus must die. The wow. prophets have always wow. led to Jesus, and Jesus must die. And so the reaffirmation, that must have meant a lot for Jesus to mm. hear the law and the prophets say that. Wow. And then, you know, after his resurrection in Luke 24, Jesus actually says that. He, he walks them through and shows how the law and the prophets yeah. and the wisdom and yeah. the Psalms all pointed to him and pointed to this act. Okay. That's really clear. And then there's this tr talk about the transfiguration. Oh, my goodness. Like he's, he's seen in a, in a new okay. way, in a... Yeah, unveiled way. Well, it's important, I think, for us to keep in mind, he's not becoming other than he has always been. Yeah, right. I, I used to live right. with that, and that's why I struggle. Like, okay, he, he, for for thir he's probably, what, 32 years old now, right? If, if we're right about the dating. Um, and it's like he's been one person, and now he becomes another person. No, he's the same person. He's always been who he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Oh, uh, good. Um, it's just now we see it. And they're seeing him more fully as he is. That's right. It makes me think about, um, I mentioned Revelation 1, that encounter John, John encounters Jesus, and he, it's declared about Christ in that moment, he's first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And it's, it's this rem reminder for me, like this is the same Jesus we're studying in the whole Gospel of Mark. He has been, he is beginning and end. And so it's not as if he's just becoming Something, something different, wasn't. no. Yeah, beautiful. So what is being manifested is light. It's oozing through his clothing. Luke says his face shines like the sun. Yeah. Like, dude, I mean, the sun. Yeah. I, I sometimes look out my window at the sun, and I'm, I'm in awe of the sun. Yeah. I can see why people worship the sun. But his huh. face is like the sun. Wow. So, yeah. so we, we speak, there's a song we sing. Um, he wraps, wraps himself. himself in light. I love it. He, yes, that's true. But he is fundamentally is light. Yeah. Well, you and I had a conversation about in a month him ago. Is light? There's no darkness at all. And you were yeah. so moved when you talked that yeah. day about that. So impacting for me. And which is true. He at is his core, fundamentally light. Beautiful. And now that's becoming really clear. Mm. And I think that would explain why people were both drawn to him and put off by mm. him before he said a word. There's something about this man. He's contagious, light. There's something about this man. This light is going to expose me. I got to get away. Right. Well, John chapter three talks about that, right? God so loved the world. He sent his son. And then it says, but the verdict is, you know, people haven't come to the light because they love dark. They love their deeds are evil. That's right. And so, you know, lights come into the world, but humans have loved darkness rather than light because they want to hide away. And that's fat, but it doesn't change the essence of who he is as good and pure and light itself. Beautiful. And so he, the voice reaffirms yes, all that. Yes. This is my son. Well, we could say a lot about that. Yeah. This is the chosen one, but I think that we'll emphasize here. The, uh, the, that's the voice of the father, similar to what Jesus hears on this baptism, but now saying to the disciples, mm -hmm. listen to him. Yes. So, you know, and I could wax away homologically on that. When he says, this is the way to life, lose it, listen to him. When he says, if you're thirsty, come and drink of me, listen to him. Yeah. And when he says, I'm the bread of life, listen to him. He's telling you the truth. He's coming out of light. These yeah. words come out of light. Beautiful. And then I love how it ends. Moses and Elijah disappear. I don't know if the cloud disappears. I think so. And Jesus is left alone. And I think that's the, the Holy Spirit who inspired the text's way of saying, listen to him. He's now standing alone because this is God's final word to the world. 
Yes. You hear a lot of other words, but all those other words are now accountable to this word. Yeah. And boy, we need this in our time. Yeah. Lots of voices about what yeah. it means to be human. Yeah. Lots of voices about how go governments work. Yeah. Lots of voices on that. This is the one voice. It's like that, um, it's Hebrews 1, right? In the past, he's spoken in many ways through the prophets. Good. Now, he's spoken to us by a son, by, by the son. And so the most ultimate way, this is what we believe as Christians, that God has spoken to humanity and to us today in our living rooms, wherever we are, is through Jesus himself. And I think, I mean, the more I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm just soaking it up that we should look at this text as this massive exclamation mark on this Jesus of Nazareth, who's been walking around doing all this ministry, this is the one the prophets proclaimed. This is the one the law has been pointing towards. And this is the one who, as has been prophesied, is going to die for the sins of the world, is going to rise um, for our salvation. And so we should posture ourselves, remember who we're studying, talking about, not just a good teacher, Lord, King of the universe. And we want to go, we should listen to him like the father says. And I feel like that's a great setup for conversation yeah. tonight to just go, you know, how, okay, it's emphasized we should be listening to him. What do we need to hear from him? What do we want to hear from him? What, what should we be adhering to that we might not be? Where, where, are, where might we be drifting from listening to his voice? Any, any other prompts for us, Daryl, as we go into conversation, like just things that you'd love for our community to think about or talk about in light of this text? I said in the sermon, that one day, one day, each of us in one way or another is going to have an encounter similar to this. Wow. I, we're going to meet the light. And I love Chris's line where he says, loved by the light. Hmm. We're going to discover, meet this light. Loved by and the light. And discover that the light so loved the world hmm. that he gave his life for us. So what does it mean so to we live can be for alive. that day? And what does that say in or, terms of... Because oh, we're running out of time. No, but good. John, that's interesting, does not record this story. Hmm. That's because for John, the whole of Jesus' life is one sustained manifestation of this light. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a promise that we're going to see this light in a lot of different ways oh, cool. throughout our life until we see that light in all of its glory. Wow. Um, but so to anticipate moments when the light breaks through, Oh, good. Like Tuesday morning staff meeting. <laughs> when we were worshiping, you led us in worship. I was overwhelmed. Yeah. The light that shone on us and through the staff's eyes. Yeah, beautiful. There was a moment we were not on a mountain. Yeah. But, and it wasn't blazing. Yeah. But I knew the light was there. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, And we trust that that'll be the case for yeah. You. Yeah. So we invite you to take time to have a conversation, to pray, to worship uh, this evening, and just believe that the Lord is going to show up in power and remind you of what matters. We love you. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs>